morning I'm going to be uh, talking from down here because, uh, you know, again, we're, we're building towards uh, Christmas and we're, we c- took a less is more kind of approach because we re- really want the focus to be on the manger. And we want the focus during this whole Advent season to be the question of what child is this? And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're going to be looking at an answer that Matthew gives. You know, we're, we'll look at it from, you know, Mary's perspective and Joseph's perspective and wise men and shepherds and different people's perspective, but actually Matthew has an opinion about this. And we see this uh, most clearly. I mean, we see it all through the gospel of Matthew, but, um, but we see it most clearly uh, or, or very clearly in uh, Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Now, many people would say this is the most boring chapter in all of Scripture, because, um, which is something strange to say about Scripture, and I, I don't believe it, but th- some people would say this is the most boring chapter because it's the genealogy of Jesus. It's all the names that if I were to have asked you to read Scripture this morning, you would have looked at this and you would have said, no, thank you, um, because there are all these Old Testament names that you don't want to read, and I don't want to read any more than you do because I don't know how to pronounce them any better than you do. I'll just say them with confidence. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to read through these names because in these names, friends, there is way more than meets the eye. There are stories behind these names. I hope that you'll look at this. I hope you'll go do a word search, a name search behind all of the names that you hear. Uh, So many of these names are mentioned in Scripture, and you can read about their stories. uh, And I'm just going to, we're going to dip into some of them this morning. But this this, uh, first 17 verses of Matthew chapter 1 is Matthew's answer to the question, what child is this? And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. I want to invite you to hear these words. Please give me grace um, if you know that I didn't pronounce it correctly, although I do not anticipate most of you knowing whether I pronounce it correctly, since I don't even know if I will pronounce them correctly. This is the genealogy of Jesus. Actually, the, the words there in Greek are, this is the, the genesis, the genesis of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? It's the first book of the New Testament pointing back to the first book of the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament. This is the genesis of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And here we go. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez or Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David, and you're thinking, finally a name that I recognize. David was the father of Solomon, uh, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Isaiah. Isaiah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Are you still with me? Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile in Babylon. Now, that little phrase, at the time of the exile to Babylon, is an important phrase because from that time on, you begin to see this longing for a Messiah, right? All the messianic expectations, so much of that happens because of this exile that begins in Babylon. There are multiple exiles, but... So after the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud. Abihud, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Achim. Achim, the father of Elihud. Elihud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of, Marth, um, of Mathan. Uh, Mathan. 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 Anyone? Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Next week, somebody else can read that if they'd like up here. Will you guys pray with me? 
God, thank you for your word that even when it seems like it's just a bunch of names, that there's more to it than what we see. God, I pray, God, that you would have a word for us this morning, that you would speak a word through me or that you would speak a word in spite of me. But, God, we're thankful that your word still speaks. And, God, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would be our teacher because I know that uh, we didn't come to hear me talk. And I pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, so Ginger really likes Christmas. Actually, Noah really likes Christmas, too. We all like Christmas in our family, but, but Ginger and Noah are like Christmas people on steroids, okay? And they like all the trimmings, right? They like the, the, the beautiful lights and the decorations. They like to decorate. They like to, you know, get gifts. They like to buy gifts. Ginger really loves to buy gifts. And, and so, um, so in contemplation of how much she loves Christmas and how we're always kind of strapped for cash and all that kind of stuff around this time of year, I decided, and, and in lieu of the fact that, uh, in light of the fact that she actually didn't get to celebrate her birthday in August because her birthday was August the 27th, there's a little thing called Harvey, and so she didn't get to celebrate her birthday, or she, she celebrated it with a hurricane. So, um, so we, I decided that this Christmas season, and she always says, you know, we never do like fun things at Christmas, and so I said, this year we're going to do it. So I bought, I bought tickets to Santa's Wonderland. Uh, out, you know what I'm talking about when I say something? There's that place out there on Highway 6, it's on the way to some little town called College Station or something. Now, it's not in College Station because Longhorns don't go to College Station. It's actually in Navasota. That's where we go. We go to Navasota, I guess. And uh, it's, it's kind of halfway between the two cities. But anyway, it's right there on Highway 6. And, and it, you know, it's lights and it's live music and pretty things. And it's, it's, it was fun. It wasn't exactly inexpensive to go. And so, you know, we, I, I, we bought these tickets back in late October, got them at the cheapest of the cheap kind. I decided we were gonna we were gonna go, and so the day arrived. It was gonna be the Sunday after Thanksgiving that we were gonna go. Now, apparently, there are some college students who like to go home back to their colleges at Baylor and the University of Texas in Austin, and to uh, this university that's also in College Station, that's uh, the Texas A and M University, and they apparently all go along the same route the Sunday after Thanksgiving. Now, I didn't think about this when uh, when I decided we were all going to go uh, several weeks in advance, and so I, that's, so we were scheduled to go. I, we converged with uh, our oldest daughter and our second oldest daughter and their significant others, and Weston, our grandson, was there, and so all that kind of stuff. So, so we went, and we, and, and we, we converged on a restaurant in Katy, and we, and we set off to go to uh, Santa's Wonderland in Navasota. And as we, as we left, as we, as we went, um, Siri, I asked Siri, I type in the little you know, address, and I said, tell me how to get there, Siri. And so Siri starts talking to me. Now, if you're, if you're, if you're directionally challenged, you're not, this may not make a ton of sense to you, but I'm going to kind of draw it for you with my hands right here in front of you. So basically, we were already in Katy, right on the Grand Parkway, and it basically said, just keep going on Grand Parkway, go north on the Grand Parkway until you, cr- till you go past 290. Now, I knew that I needed to go on 290 to get where I was going. But Siri was telling me to go past 290 and go up about two exits and then turn and then come back around to 290. And then to go this way on 290 for about an exit. And then you get on another street and you go up here a few miles and then you go around and you come back to 290. Now, she didn't have, she didn't have the, um, the uh, smarts or the, uh, the common manners to tell me that there, if there was going to be some kind of construction or some kind of traffic, I mean, I went, I double clicked, and I was like, "There's, there's no." I expanded, and there was no red, there was no yellow, there's no anything. It just looked like Siri was on an acid trip. <laughs> We're going to go past 290, come back around, go up, come back around, go back to 290, and then we go on our way. And she told me it would take an hour and 15 minutes. Now, at this moment, some of you are wondering, you're thinking, "Did Matt?" pay attention to Siri, and if he did, was he correct in paying attention to Siri, and if he didn't, was he a moron, and he should have paid attention to Siri, and in fact, I'd like to go ahead and take a poll. (laughs) So how many of you think that, uh, I'll just tell you, I didn't listen to Siri, now, but how many of you think that your, your spiritual leader, your, your pastor was, should not have, should not, he did the right thing by not paying attention to Siri? Is there anyone who's going to raise their hand right now, that I did the right thing by not paying attention to Siri. A few of you, God bless you. Now, how many of you think, Matt, Siri has satellites. Siri 
has complex uh, algorithms. How many of you think I should have listened to Siri, and if I had, the day would have gone much better? Now, can I see the hands again of the other people just one more time, the people who thought I did the right thing? I love you, but you're wrong. Your pastor's a moron, and I should have. And it took us an extra 45 minutes, 50 minutes or something of traffic because I didn't pay attention to what Siri was trying to tell me. Now, I knew that she, she has the satellites, and she has the complex algorithms, and she has access to the Internet, and I just have my gut feelings. But it just seemed weird to me. If there was, if, if there was traffic, I wish she just would have told me there was traffic. If there was, uh, if there was construction, I wish she would have told me there was construction. Apparently, there was both. And so I decided to go, and, I, and as soon as I got on the overpass going from 99 onto 290, I realized I had made a very, very big mistake. And it ended up taking us like two hours and five minutes, what should have taken us an hour and 15 minutes at the most, from that place in Katy to get there. Now, friends, Siri was trying to be my friend. Siri was trying to point me in the right direction. She was using all of her wisdom and all of her knowledge and all of her information, and she was putting it to the best use, and she was trying to point me in the right direction. Hey, this is where you should go. This is what you should do. But it doesn't matter. How many of you know that you can have all the wisdom and information and knowledge in the world and decide to ignore it, right? Yeah, well, that's what I did. She was trying to tell me, point me in the right direction, but I just ignored her. Friends, Matthew is pointing us in the right direction this morning. Matthew is, is, is even though these are just, a, it's a list of names. He, is, he has written a gospel. He has undertaken to write this book, this story of the genesis of Jesus, the story of who Jesus is and his entire story, and he is trying to point us in the right direction. And he's not just some third or fourth or fifth or tenth hand source. He's not some guy 2,000 years later trying to make heads or tails out of this information. This is a guy, Matthew, who walked with Jesus. This is a guy who was there. This is a guy who was there when Jesus fed the 5,000. This is a guy who was there when Jesus, you know, spit in the dirt and rubbed mud in a guy's eye to make the blind man see again. This is a guy who was there. And he's trying to point us in the right direction. And he starts it in verse 1 of chapter 1 of, this, of, of the gospel that he's undertaken to written, the good news that he's undertaken to written. He's trying to point us in the right direction. But it doesn't matter if he has all this firsthand information. It doesn't matter if he has all this wisdom if we're going to ignore it. Friends, he's trying to answer the question for us, what child is this? And he starts there in the first verse, and he, he starts this. He, he, I've already said this at the beginning. He starts it off with the genesis of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, son of, who is son, son of Abraham, son of David. Now, he, his first answer to the question, what child is this? is basically, he's the child that you've been waiting for. And that's why, that's why he says, the son of Abraham, son of David. So let's go back, let's do some history um, of, of, of Abraham and who Abraham is. So Abraham uh, is, you know, kind of the father of the, of the Hebrew people, right? He is, uh, you know, God uh, comes and he finds him. At the time, Abraham, basically a pagan, he's, he's worshiping his family gods in a country somewhere else, and God comes to him and he says, hey, if you'll go where I send you, if you'll, if you'll trust me and you'll go where I send you, I will make a great nation out of your people, out of your offspring, right? I'll, uh, you know, as many as there are stars in the sky, that's how big your family's going to get, and that's what, the, what a great nation he's going to make out of you. And so that's the, the first promise that God makes to Abraham, and Abraham does exactly what God says, and he goes uh, to this place where God is going to show him. That's the first part of the promise. The second part of the promise, though, in Genesis, that God makes to Abraham is not only um, am I going to make a great nation out of your people, but I'm also going to bless. He said all nations, all peoples will be blessed because of you. Now, the first part of that promise has already been uh, taken care of by the time of Jesus, right? I mean, now Abraham has turned into the people of Israel, and there's a, there is a nation, and and, and they've had history, and they've had kings and judges, and, you know, the whole Old Testament is about that, the fulfillment of that promise. But the second half of that promise, friends, has not been fulfilled, that God was going to use Abraham's people to bless all nations, to bless all peoples everywhere. So one of the things Matthew's doing here by pointing back to the son of Abraham, I mean, one of the things he's doing is saying, hey, he's one of us, like he's squarely one of us. He is a son of Abraham, but he's also pointing to the fact that Jesus is going to be the fulfillment of even that second promise, that he's going to be a savior to all peoples. And then he goes on and he says, but he's also a son of David. Now, you, again, you need to understand the, the history here. So David is the presiding king over the nation of Israel at their, at their peak 
of their power and influence in their region. So, so David has, uh, has come in and, you know, he takes over for Saul and, and you know, they have their, their biggest glory is under David. Their unified kingdom, things are going well. And so after uh, we talked about those, uh, you know, uh, where you know, the, the Babylonians and others, have, they've come and they've hauled them off into exile. And, and, and during that time, they begin to yearn for another David. And actually, um, we, at this time, at the time of Jesus' birth, now the Romans have come in and they are an occupying force. So these people are longing for these promises to be fulfilled. And in the Old Testament, we see promises like, unto us, a child is born, unto us a son is given. He will be called, you know, wonderful counselor and prince of peace and mighty God and, uh, you know, everlasting father. You know, the, all, these, all these messianic expectations of the Old Testament have yet to be fulfilled. They are yearning. They just want God to come back in and just make us like we were. This is make Israel great again. That's what this is. These people are dying to be made what they used to be. And so Matthew says, this is the kid. What child is this? This is the one. This is the child. And he's going to be the one who's going to fulfill the promises to Abraham to make a great nation. He's going to be one to fulfill the promises to David to make uh, to, to restore the people and, and the promises he made to us he's tapping into the messianic expectations that were rampant in jesus day and so that's what that's what he starts off with and so his, his basic idea there is he's the one he's the child that you have been waiting for i wonder if there's some people this morning that are waiting for something just like they were waiting for a Messiah to come. I wonder if there's some people this morning that were waiting, people who are waiting, uh, maybe, it is, uh, maybe it's to restore a broken marriage. Or maybe, it's, maybe uh, your, your marriage has ended and you're hoping that God's going to bring you that next person. Maybe you're out of work and you're praying that if God will just give me that job, that, that next job. Or maybe you already have a job and you're waiting for that promotion or that, that next title or the next raise. If I could just get over this hump, it's going to be just like it was or it's going to be better than it ever was. I wonder if there are people this morning longing for something. Maybe it's something as simple as that God would give you some help with an addiction or God would give you help with anxiety or depression. I mean, maybe you're just, maybe you're, you're just longing and expecting something. And if that is you, the, the message from Matthew to the people of Israel is still a message that we can grab onto. It is that he is the one that we are expecting. When you get all of those things that you think that you're longing for, they will not be what you think. They will never make you as whole as you wish and want and desire to be. Jesus is the one that we've been longing for, is the one that we've been waiting for. That's Matthew's first answer to the question of what child is this? He's the one. And not only is he the one, he's actually better than the one because they're waiting for a king to come in on a stallion. They're not waiting for some Messiah to be born in the stable. He's not only the one that you've been waiting for, but he's better than the one that you've been waiting for. That's, that's Matthew's first answer. But, but his other answer to the question, and this is where you get into all those names, um, is that Jesus is a Savior uh, that is born of sinners, by sinners, and for sinners. I, I want you to think about some of those names. Now, you also need to understand how important genealogies are in, in, the, you know, in the Hebrew culture. So in that day, like everybody would have known who their father and grandfather and great-grandfather and great-grandfather's great-grandfather was, right? They, they kept genealogies. That was very important to them. And certainly no self-respecting Messiah would ever have written the kind of genealogy. Or certainly if they had had it, they would have never shared it. Is what G, as what Matthew does for Jesus here. I mean, if you go through these names, I mean, again, we think of these as just a list of names, but these aren't just names. Go back and do name searches. Go back and do word searches in the Old Testament and look at who these people are. I mean, one of the things that you'll notice is, is, is that, is that uh, Jesus, uh, in, in Jesus' family, Matthew puts in, in, in G, Jesus' genealogy, uh, the first thing that you see there is Abraham, right? Uh, we see Abraham. Abraham was a man of faith, right? And through him, great nation, all that kind of stuff. But he was also a liar. He lied about Sarah being his wife, said he, she was his sister. And uh, he did that because he didn't trust God. Uh, he didn't really trust God's promise. And he didn't want to be killed. So that's, we start off with Abraham. And then we've got, you know, a couple names later, we've got Jacob. Well, Jacob steals Esau's blessing and his birthright. And, uh, you know, he was the second born of the twins. But he, he steals Esau's 
blessing. I mean, if you just go down this list, Judah is in this list. Judah sleeps with a prostitute who ends up being his daughter-in-law. You got Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute. These are not people, and, and, the, and not only was Rahab a prostitute, the other thing you need to no, notice here is that uh, the fact that Matthew even uh, includes women in this genealogy would have also been an earth-shattering idea. They would have not in Jesus' day, and ladies, please don't send me to hate mail. I didn't write the rules back then, but they didn't put uh, uh, ladies' names, women's names in their genealogies. They traced the bloodline typically back through the male. So, so Matthew could have easily left this out. I mean, no self-respecting Messiah would have had a prostitute in his bloodline. And if he had, they would have hidden it. They wouldn't have even talked about it. But Matthew makes sure that it's in there. Then we get to David. And you know David's story. Many of you know David's story. David has an affair with Bathsheba, who is married to Uriah. And, and Uriah is actually mentioned in here. Well, in the midst of that, you had, uh, so he has, a, he has an affair with uh, Bathsheba. And David is the one who's responsible for Uriah's death. He puts him on the front line, pulls the troops back. Uriah dies in battle, but he does it. He dies because David has made it so. David's a murderer. You get to Solomon. Solomon's the one under his rule. Uh, the kingdom gets split in half. He's supposed to be the wisest man in the history of the world, and yet this is a guy who had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I'm just saying. And these are just some of the names that are in this list. Now, here's the question. This is the question that I was asking this week. Why doesn't Matthew hide those names? Why doesn't Matthew say, you know what, um, we can trace Jesus back to Abraham, but we might mean to take some circuitous routes to get there. And why don't we just kind of omit that one? Um, and there's a, we'll just leave that generation out. And, you know, why didn't he just highlight the righteous people? I mean, this is the Messiah. This is the Savior. This is the one who is coming to embrace you know, and, and, and to save us and all that. He's this religious leader extraordinaire. Why doesn't Matthew hide those names? You know why Matthew doesn't hide those names? I think Matthew's trying to make a point. And I think Matthew knows. I think Jesus, uh, I think Matthew doesn't hide those names. He's not ashamed to include those names in Jesus' past because he knows that Jesus was not ashamed to meet those people in his past. I mean, Matthew was there, right? Are you with me? Matthew was there when, uh, when Jesus got in trouble because he hung out with prostitutes and tax collectors. They called Jesus a drunkard because he hung out with people who drank. They called Jesus, his own family, as Mac talked about last week, thought that he was crazy for, uh, at the beginning of his ministry. They, 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 all these people, some of these people thought he was demon-possessed, and those same people who thought he was demon-possessed at one minute, the next minute they would try to forcibly make him king. Matthew was there when all of these people thought that he was crazy, that he was possessed, when he hung out with all the wrong people, all the non-religious people, when he got in the face of all the religious people like me. And he told us the truth. Matthew doesn't hide these people from Jesus' past because he knew that Jesus didn't hide from them when they were in his past. Jesus didn't run away from broken people. He ran to broken people. This is, this is a Messiah who is from sinners, of sinners, for sinners. And I hope that there's somebody else in this room besides me. I hope that there is someone else in this room besides me who is really, really glad that that's the kind of God that we serve, who doesn't run away from sinners. He runs towards us because if, because if he didn't, if he doesn't, then friends, none of us could be here today. I am so thankful that we serve a God, that we serve a Messiah, that the baby born in this manger is going to be a child who is of sinners and from sinners. He's for sinners. He's from broken people to save broken people like me and maybe like you. So I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. We're, we're going to move into a time of communion, but Philip Yancey, a few years ago in the 1990s, early 1990s, uh, he wrote an article um, that it was about a Messiah sighting in Brooklyn, uh, New York. And it was among the, uh, the uh, Lubavitcher Hasidic Jews that lived there, about 20,000 or so that live in that region. 
And they believed at that time, and some still believe today, that they were living in the time of the real Messiah, Rabbi uh, Menachem Mendel Schneerson was his name. He was 91 years old when Yancey wrote this article, and he, was, he had had a stroke the year before, and uh, he couldn't even speak at this point. He was, he was, because of the stroke, he couldn't even speak. What he basically would do is uh, he would go and have you know, a public prayer service. He'd be, he would go in public, uh, but he couldn't say anything, and people would come, and then he would raise his hand, and they would close the curtains, and then they would all go. In fact, uh, some of these Hasidic Jews, they actually had beepers. You remember beepers? Right? They had these beepers, and uh, when, when any of them would feel this thing begin to vibrate, they would drop whatever they were doing, these thousands of people, and they would run to the synagogue where uh, Schneerson was going to be because they just wanted to catch a glimpse of him. And they would go into the, to the area, and, and wherever, uh, you know, wherever they could get, they would shove themselves into this synagogue, and some of them would even climb the rafters to make more room so they could see him better. And they'd open the curtain, and he'd come out. It wouldn't say a word. He'd wave at them. They would, they would chant, they would chant these chants. And when he came out, they would say together, our teacher, our rabbi, long live our master, King Messiah, forever and ever. That was the chant they would chant over and over and over again. Then he would wave his hand, they'd close the curtains, and slowly the crowd would disperse. Now, Yancey um, wrote that article, and he said his first, when he first heard about that, he thought this was absurd. Like, what kind of people would believe this craziness, right? Like, what kind of crazy people would go and they would do this? He said it was more like a, a, a rock concert or, a, or a, a, you know, a, a sporting event than it was a religious service. And he kind of scoffed at the notion that these people would believe in this until he remembered, until he realized that he was having the same kind of reaction to them, as people would have had to Jesus when he was born. Now, friends, the truth is, um, Matthew's trying to point us. He's using all of his satellites and all of his complicated algorithms. He's using his life experience. He lived with Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He served Jesus if anybody knew that Jesus was the Messiah, Matthew was certainly one of the people that would have. He watched him. He learned from him. He saw him alive again. I mean, this was somebody who knew. Jesus called Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. If anybody knew who Jesus was, if anybody knew that Jesus was somebody who ran two broken people and not away from him, Matthew knew that. Matthew's trying to point us in the direction of the true Messiah. But friends, people of Jesus' day, they, they would have thought he was crazy. At the end of the day, the truth is, it doesn't really matter who Matthew thinks that Jesus was. It doesn't matter how Matthew answers the question, what child is this that we're going to be uh, looking to the manger to see who it is. It doesn't matter what Matthew says. You can have all the knowledge and all the wisdom and all the information put right in front of you. And so can I. And we can ignore it. What child is this? Well, Matthew's answer, and I hope our answer, is that this is the one we've been waiting for. This is the one we've been longing for. In fact, he's better than the one that we've been waiting for and the one that we've been longing for. This is the God who runs not away from sinners but towards them. He is of sinners, from sinners, and he is, most importantly, he is for sinners. He didn't run away. He didn't duck and cover from sinners, he walked towards them. That's the child that this is. That's the answer. That's Matthew's answer. And maybe it'll even be yours to the answer of the question, what child is this?